Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, So I'm uh, speaking to you this morning from uh, First Nations uh, Coast Salish Territory here in beautiful downtown Vancouver. It's the homeland of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Um, and uh, I'm a guest on their territory uh, as a member of Mississaugas of the Credit uh, First Nations. Um, and and uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here with this whole network. On this slide, we have a number of goals that I've set out for my part of the talk. And obviously, it's a very brief snapshot of the historical uh, and current perspectives on Indigenous people's health in Canada, how we got to the health disparities that currently exist, uh, the determinants of health, the ethical principles of engagement with Indigenous peoples and communities, and uh, briefly touching on reconciliation and health at which point I will turn it over to Dr. McAvock. Um, first of all, uh, in our uh, customary way, I would like to, uh, to uh, uh, situate myself uh, as we usually do. And, and this is important because in understanding our connections to the world and how we view the world, we need to start by situating ourselves. It's part of our identity. So in the middle, I have uh, a picture of my late parents, my indigenous father, Lloyd, and my Swiss mother, Margaret. Uh, and I was uh, the product of that union, born on the reserve uh, a number of years ago, grew up there, and then went away to university and my career. And there's various family pictures around, including the very geeky young uh, graduate of McMaster University at the bottom. And in the uh, upper left corner, uh, uh, the drawing of my uh, great-great-grandfather, Chief George King, who uh, was among the group that led our people to our current location, the New Credit Reserve, from the banks of the Credit, which is where we originally lived uh, in what's now the town of Mississauga. Uh, George King was the last of the hereditary chiefs and the first elected chief of our band in 1870. So we're celebrating 170 years of uh, being uh, neighbors to the, the Six Nations of the Grand, where we currently live. Um, this uh, overview uh, shows the indigenous population of Canada by province and territory, indicating very small numbers of uh, indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, in the southern provinces, particularly in the east, uh, rather larger percentages uh, in uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan and uh, in the far north, although the overall population is much lower, the percentage of indigenous people uh, goes up considerably. Um, the the uh, graph on the left indicates the divisions in population according to registered Indian, non-status Indian, those are still the official terms uh, for First Nations in Canada. The Métis were a, a substantial uh, group, part of our population, and the Inuit, uh, whose homelands are in the north and east. Uh, and the other uh, thing on the right is the age structure of indigenous population. Uh, the blue background shows the overall population with, with its bulge uh, in the so-called baby boom. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it a rather flat profile up until the age of 50 or so. Whereas uh, for indigenous populations, there's a very slight baby boom bulge that includes myself, for instance, uh, but much larger percentages of uh, children and youth. 
uh, it's a profile that one sees in low and middle income countries typically, and not so much in uh, in in the high income countries of uh, the north. Um, I wanted to talk about history, and I'm not a historian. I'm a a chemist and a, a medical scientist by training, uh, but uh, history is important in terms of health because we need to understand how we got to the current state. So this overview of uh, Canada and its treaty making process, I could easily spend more than an hour on this, but I won't, uh, starts uh, on the coast particularly the East Coast, uh, with the first contact with uh, Europeans, and then uh, spreads westwards, and then from the West Coast, uh, 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 spreading inland as well. Uh, the first flag that's there is the uh, flag of the uh, Six Nations Confederation, the five uh, nations confederacy which predated European contact uh, and that's really why we start with that um, the one of the first treaties uh, that took place is the treaty uh, that's called the Schwenta in Mohawk the two row wampum belt and it's a treaty between the Haudenosaunee people uh, the uh, five nations of the Europe as they were then, and the Dutch, uh, the Europeans who first settled the area that's now known as New York. And when these two groups came together, uh, they negotiated a treaty uh, that's symbolized by this two-row wampum belt. Uh, the purple beads, which were very valuable beads, they actually came from the east coast of uh, North America. Uh, and they represented the two uh, peoples, uh, the one row representing a sailboat for the Europeans and the second row representing a canoe for the Native Americans. And then the white beads uh, uh, around them represent qualities of peace, friendship, and forever. And this quote uh, uh, comes from the treaty that was made which is very important. We shall travel down the road of life parallel to each other and never merging with each other. This is a treaty between equals. This is a treaty of peace and friendship and non-interference. Uh, it, it goes on to say things like uh, neither side will try to uh, steer the other's uh, vessel. Uh, but what happened Subsequently, and this is now uh, much later, uh, 250 years later, things did not go that way. These are the treaties that occurred just after the uh, Canadian Confederation, which is being celebrated this weekend, uh, in the early 1870s. Uh, Canada acquired the land that drains into Hudson Bay from the Hudson Bay Company. And it didn't actually have legal ownership of that land, not even by European uh, standards. And so there, there was a, uh, a really urgent push to negotiate treaties with the people who live in the central part of Canada. This was more than uh, doubling the land area of Canada at the time. Uh, and, and so there were these treaties. Uh, uh, Kathy mentioned Treaty 1 around Winnipeg. That was the first of those. And then uh, there were a whole uh, a bunch of others uh, negotiated over the subsequent years. These were treaties uh, of inequality. That's the, perhaps the best way to uh, point out. By, by then, by the late 19th century, uh, many of our people were, uh, were starving. We were certainly, uh, the, the, the buffalo, the main source of food on the prairies, uh, had been almost exterminated. Uh, and and uh, so there were treaties between uh, 
very unequal groups, and as a result, our people ended up on small reserves, uh, often marginalized land, and dependent on uh, government aid for survival. But nevertheless, the treaties all had some important basic concepts that we need to remember as Canadians. There were a treaty that allowed European settlement to occur, so that's the in basic reason why Europeans could come and settle in those treaty lands. And there were uh, clauses in those treaties that were important uh, in terms of stewardship of the land, uh, an agreement to mutually look after the land uh, and, and uh, inherently Mother Earth that we all uh, look to. Uh, later on in uh, the late uh, 20th century, there were a number of other treaties in the far north that were much more between equals again, and those are important things. And then finally, for, for us in British Columbia and for other parts of the country, including around Ottawa, uh, the land is uh, unceded and there's still treaty making going on, and this is very important uh, to keep in mind. Um, following the uh, confinement of our people to reserves, uh, there followed the Indian Act of 1876. <coughs> uh, the residential schools uh, have been talked about a lot, of course, and uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which uh, uh, presented its report just years ago, uh, focused a lot on uh, the residential school treatment. Um, and, and again, these pictures just illustrate uh, particularly the, the one of the young uh, boy whose uh, image converted from the uh, traditional uh, First Nation child that he was into uh, what the residential schools hoped to achieve which was assimilation, uh, and it was a, uh, a very uh, uh, bad idea. It didn't work, and uh, it should never have been done, as, uh, as I think we all know and we need to acknowledge. Um, this continues, uh, uh, and, and, and the problem with the residential schools in many ways was the disconnection. Children were disconnected uh, from their families, uh, from their communities for months at a time, sometimes uh, forever, uh, not getting back. Uh, and they lost a vital part, uh, which is uh, familial connections. They also lost, in many cases, their language, their culture. But losing familial connect, uh, connections resulted in uh, uh, behaviors that led to uh, poor conditions on uh, for many children. So by the 1960s, there were vast numbers of children on our First Nations Reserve who needed care, but instead of putting them in care with extended families uh, uh, in within the community as the traditional system would have been to look after children. They were placed out of the community uh, in foster care, in many cases in adoptions, uh, well away from their community and losing further those connections. So this was known as the 60s scoop uh, and it resulted actually in even more children uh, losing connections with their language, their culture, their communities than there were even at the height of the residential school uh, uh, period. And so you get into the idea of multi-generational uh, trauma, not just the first generation of children that were taken away from their families in the early part of uh, the 20th century, but subsequent uh, generations, two, three, four generations, where these, uh, these critical connections are disrupted and uh, early childhood trauma 
uh, is an important feature. Uh, we also then get into some other important things, very important, such as uh, experience with the criminal justice system. Uh, and again, the statistics are striking, although only 4.3% of the Canadian population identify as Indigenous, you have 23% uh, uh, of the federal inmate population who are Indigenous. Uh, and it goes across all of the Indigenous groups, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. And this over-representation is even growing, so that uh, uh, you have this large increase just in the last decade of uh, federal Aboriginal inmate population. Women are particularly over-represented compared with non-Indigenous uh, women and represent 34% uh, of all federally sent sentenced women. You also have longer sentences uh, uh, routinely classified as higher risk and so on. And we've all heard the horror stories of uh, inmates uh, committing suicide in solitary confinement, for instance, uh, but uh, it's a major issue. Um, so. I wanted to now switch a little bit to determinants of health. Uh, and, and there are, as most public health students uh, will, will know, and uh, you have the conventional determinants of health, income, social status, poverty, education. These are all very important to everyone, including Indigenous people. Income is a, 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 and poverty are, are major issues. But we also have Indigenous specific determinants of health, which uh, uh, I discuss in the article that's uh, listed at the bottom. Uh, these all relate to the various aspects of colonization, uh, which is not just racism, but it's uh, attempts at assimilation, depriving people of their culture and connectivity to land, which are important determinants of health. But on the other hand, there are positive determinants of health related to uh, being Indigenous, and particularly the self-determination that uh, assists and resists uh, 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 pathologies, uh, the resilience. Uh, there are a number of other important determinants of health that have Indigenous specific impact. Globalization, racism in general, gender and, uh, and worldviews. Uh, a lot of these determinants of health tend to layer upon each other. So it's not just one thing. It's not just indigeneity and race. It's also poverty. It's also gender equality, inequalities, identity issues. You add to that residential school experience, foster care systems, and then it leads to things like uh, addictions and ultimately to suicides. So counterbalancing it are important things such as resilience, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, so we, there is no single indigenous worldview that's important to emphasize it, not even within Canada, not even within uh, groups of First Nations or Inuit or Métis. But there are some commonalities. This critical bond to land and nature we find uh, almost everywhere. As the territory and natural environment are reflected in our knowledge systems and social arrangements. We're connected with our landscape and our knowledge is experiential, observational, and holistic. Kinship is important, including the spirit realm, and time has this cyclical uh, aspect to it. Uh, when it comes to research, uh, we have some important uh, principles that are outlined in the Tri-Council policy statement, uh, the second version, chapter nine, uh, which deals with research involving First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I won't go through all of them, but there's some key concepts here. One is a requirement, a real need 
for engagement with indigenous communities in the research that we do. I think we all uh, understand this, but it's very important. We need to respect uh, governance and governing authorities within our communities, but we also need to recognize that some of our communities, such as those in urban centers, are communities that don't have these formal governance structures, but they still uh, have uh, important aspects of engagement. These are still important. We need to respect community customs and codes of practice. And we also need to work with our institutional research ethics boards and uh, especially enter into research agreements uh, before uh, conducting the research. Uh, there needs to be collaboration and mutual benefits in research. Strengthening research capacity in our community partners is an important role, really is necessary, and, and we need to recognize the role of elders and other knowledge holders. Um, this famous diagram from Professor Willie Ermine of First Nations University uh, uh, illustrates the idea of coming together as Western people and indigenous people. I guess in some ways I have an advantage of growing up in two backgrounds, but even then, uh, whichever uh, indigenous group, I would not presume to go to a group in British Columbia and presume to understand their world views. We need to work it out regardless of where we're from. And we're working to find this common ground, this area of common understanding that uh, Willie Ermine calls ethical space. But another important uh, part of it, I've turned the diagram on its side here because this illustrates that we're not even uh, now in 2017 coming at it from a position of equality. Indigenous groups do not have the resources, the capacity, uh, and uh, as Western researchers, we need to respect this and make efforts to uh, reduce those inequalities so that we can truly achieve uh, that common ground that we call ethical space. Uh, we have another way of looking at it, uh, which has been promulgated by the Institute of Aboriginal People's Health which we call two-eyed seeing. And we're using the concept put forward by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall, who has put it to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing and to see from the other eye with the strengths of Western ways of knowing and to use both of these eyes together. It's important that we respect uh, all of our ways of knowing because they all have been value and legitimacy. And by bringing these things together, we achieve more than we would by just applying one or the other. We also need to learn more about listening to each other. Uh, I actually call this uh, two-eared listening uh, in, in deference to the two-eyed seeing concept of Elder Marshall. Uh, so, uh, academic people, if this was from an example for cardiovascular disease, uh, presented their ideas to community groups and expected the community groups to come up with Western approaches to disease prevention, such as smoking, cessation, nutrition, diet, and so on. But the community people also heard all of the other things, the historical context, and the Western people heard it too. But I think the community people in a way understood that income was actually in some ways the major uh, determinant of health that needed to be uh, dealt with, the poverty, and a whole lot of other determinants of health that we've talked about. And so uh, it, it, it both sides, in a way, need to learn how to listen to the other. And I guess that's what I'm trying to 
say uh, there's a lot more in the article at the bottom that uh, for those of you who want to follow it further. Um, I'm going to uh, finish uh, uh, shortly with uh, going back to uh, the historical thing. Our Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which is now uh, more than 20 years uh, on, uh, uh, uncovered a lot of what I've had to say uh, and and all of the things that were in the report 21 years ago unfortunately are still true all of these things about life expectancy homes uh, education and so on but this important concept in the next uh, slide uh, Aboriginal people do not want pity or handouts they want recognition that these problems are largely the result of loss of their lands and resources, destruction of their economies and social institutions, and denial of their nature, uh, nationhood. Uh, they seek a range of remedies, but most of all, they seek control of their lives. Uh, this is still the case, and this is so important uh, as we move forward together in addressing important health issues. Uh, and so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, came out with its calls to action uh, almost, uh, well, a year and a half ago now. And uh, what we're talking about are here in number 18, recognizing that we have to understand the past in order to understand the present, the present state of health. And to build on it, though, and establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes. Um, I will uh, just skip to this last slide before turning it over to John McGavock, because um, we need to uh, deal with, uh, uh, this illustrates the various things that add together, the racial discrimination, the colonization, the residential schools, the foster care system, all of these lead to biologic reactions, stresses, that lead to emotional responses and physical responses, and ultimately to coping behaviors and pathology, and finally at the end, end stage manifestations, both uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical. Uh, so, we don't need to let things go that way. And the blue uh, uh, feathers, if you like, are opportunities for us to get out of this cycle. Not everyone ends in this downward spiral. So we need certainly recovery interventions that include pharmaceuticals and counseling, but also land-based healing. It's important we can't leave the people who are uh, already suffering behind, but we need to consider resilient strategies much further upstream that involve ceremony, meditation, keeping in balance, and connection with land and culture. And of course, we all need to be concerned along with the greater society and those societal interventions that will keep these things from ongoing uh, uh, that happenings of trauma. So with that, I will turn it over to John McGavick, and uh, I thank you very much, T. McGwetch. So uh, I'm here from uh, Treaty 1 Territory. My name is John McGavick. I'm a settler. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dene, and Dakota people. It's also homeland of the Métis Nation and traditional lands of the Inuit. So thank you, Malcolm. I thought it was appropriate to start with a model of resilience for youth, uh, where culture and I think connection to uh, traditional ways is really key. Um, my own story is uh, quite different from Malcolm's. I came uh, into research with an exclusively Western approach, never being taught anything about residential schools or about the history of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, and I've had wonderful trajectory and mentoring over the last uh, 10 years as an academic. Um, these are pictures from Garden Hill. My first mentor was an ADI worker, Larry Wood, um, who's mentored me through this process. And, and I'm very honored to be 
sharing the lead on some of this work within Diabetes Action Canada with another person that I consider a role model and mentor, uh, who is Alex McComber. And thirdly, uh, he's a member of both uh, SPORE networks. Uh, Barry Lavely has taught me a lot, and a lot of the things that you'll hear from me today, Barry used the sledgehammer to get into my head uh, so that I could understand it uh, a little bit better. Um, so my story comes to you as a settler and as a father and as someone who wants to make the next generation very different from the generation that I grew up in um, that really didn't recognize a lot of these views. As a settler scientist, and that, that'll be my viewpoint for the next 20 minutes or so, it's really important for us to recognize the atrocities that other settler scientists have committed to Indigenous peoples by um, promising and, and not delivering or by uh, appropriating research or appropriating knowledge and then uh, adopting it as their own. So probably the most uh, famous was, was with the uh, Havusapa Indians who live and, and keep uh, sacred the Grand Canyon. Uh, scientists went in there and took blood samples looking for genetic determinants of diabetes. Unable to find those, they subsequently went on and used those samples to uh, analyze them for a, a slew of different things, including um, most shockingly, uh, their their history and their uh, their origins, and so uh, that's not only in the U.S. That's also happened uh, in Canada as well. And so, as as settler scientists, we need to recognize that Indigenous people and elders have often said we've been researched to death, and and therefore we really need to flip that worldview and flip that relationship uh, in the way that Malcolm demonstrated. Where I think we need to, um, it's not necessarily balanced. Uh, we need to increase. Um, our listening capacities with Western settlers and prioritize the voice of Indigenous people. Malcolm and I did not coordinate our talks, but I also have uh, this here that I uh, also got from Alex McComber, um, the two-row wampum belt. Uh, and I think as settlers, we have often go in looking for ways to help, and we have to remember that that original treaty was signed that uh, this relationship will not be like father and son, but like brothers, and that's how um, we should be approaching our research. Um, methods and our research um, values and our research goals when partnering with Indigenous populations. In addition to that, we have to recognize that the atrocities of the Indian Act are driving a lot of the disparities that we're seeing in health outcomes and that it's uh, the, the structural factors that the Canadian government has established are continuing um, to limit in the trajectories and the growth of Indigenous people and that uh, we need as scientists to try to um, undo these injustices. So in the world uh, that I'm working in within pediatrics, um, the main issue that we're looking at within our research group is type 2 diabetes. On the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, type 2 diabetes rates in Manitoba, a disease that didn't exist in 1986, now affects up to 250 children each year in Manitoba, and the numbers are equal to those of type 1 diabetes. Manitoba is disproportionately affected by type 2 diabetes in youth uh, compared to other uh, regions in the country. And if we take a look at um, the group that's most affected, it's by far Indigenous youth. So for every one Caucasian child or one non-Indigenous child that's diagnosed with type 2, there are over 20 that are diagnosed uh, in the Indigenous community every year. And it's important for us to recognize that these disparities in health are the direct result of government-sponsored um, cultural genocide. So residential school atrocities, the 60s scoop, and um, current infrastructure to limit the trajectories of Indigenous youth, the government-sponsored destruction of land the, or um, language, the government-sponsored de destruction of culture, and the government destruction of land or appropriation of land all play critical roles in the health disparities that we're seeing between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, and for settler scientists, this is really, really important to recognize. I think uh, I shake every time I hear people saying, oh, it's got to be genetics, let's go look for the genetic issue, um, without first recognizing that a lot of these atrocities come from the continued and transgenerational stress uh, that occurred as a result of those factors. Um, this is one of my diagrams for the research process, uh, three main variables the generation of ideas, the infrastructure needed for a research project, and then the final output. And we need to understand that the colonial effects of the government on Indigenous people have um, really limited the capacity for all three of these things, and so we, we must integrate them right from the beginning, right through to the end, into all aspects of the research process. So generating ideas must be reflective on how do we 
create resilience and how do we overcome the atrocities of the past? Infrastructure, how do we support Indigenous people in participating in the research process? How do we ensure that the funding that's received for research makes it to, in, to communities so that communities can thrive? And then an output and the understanding and the translation of that knowledge, ensuring that the community voice is there parallel with you as a, as a settler scientist as you try to interpret and um, share your knowledge across uh, generations. There's a very nice review article that I'd suggest you take a look at by Don Warren, uh, published in 2015, looking at uh, the physiological factors that, through which historical trauma leads to health disparities, um, and really recognize that regardless of uh, whether you're in the northern part of Turtle Island or the southern part of Turtle Island, these atrocities have happened and they play a really key role in uh, the health disparities. And finally, it's important for us to acknowledge and engage patients and families. Um, this is a family that's partnered with us on several research projects. Um, this mother was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as a child. Uh, she's currently on dialysis and, and the majority of her children are currently living with type 2 diabetes. So that cycle continues and, and this is the face of the legacy of residential school atrocities. And I, I put this picture up there because we often say within this SPORE model, uh, nothing for us without us. And I think it's important for us to integrate uh, patients and their patient voice in everything that we do. So uh, Malcolm talked about the two-eyed seeing approach um, as, a, as a foundational aspect for, for settler indigenous integration with research. Um, this slide comes from Alex McComber uh, reflecting that same ethical space where on one side you have the community voice and on the other side you have the university voice and you have the university needs and you have the university type of knowledge and on the other side you have the community voice and the community knowledge and in the middle there's co-learning and reciprocal learning that can happen. So not only is it an ethical space but it's an opportunity for settler scientists to learn a lot about the Indigenous worldview specifically for the groups that you're working with um, and to allow this ethical space to happen in the right way Settlers need to take a step back, open their ears, open their hearts, and just listen, and spend more time listening and more time understanding. Um, I, I, I'm honest that I think I've learned way more working with Indigenous communities than I've ever brought to Indigenous communities in terms of knowledge, so it's a very imbalanced um, uh, relationship in my life, and I'm very grateful for that. And I think uh, it's important for us Westerners who've been taught in a Western model our entire lives very few of us have been taught about the residential school atrocities or colonization, and so I think it's time for us now in the, the era of the TRC to really open up that space and do a lot of listening. And for me, it's important, uh, the, the foundation for that is understanding, respecting, and um, bringing the principles of OCAP to everything you do within your research. And so uh, I don't want to get too much into that, but in, in a lot of the work that we do, it's important for the seller scientists to know that communities own control, access, and possess data, and it's upon us to ensure that these principles are met. Um, and it's very hard, I think, for people to understand the concept when they see data as their, their ticket to um, promotion, their ticket to publication, their ticket to their next grant. Um, for me personally, upholding the principles of OCAP is maintaining the most uh, valuable and sacred part of that research relationship, which is uh, the relationship itself with our communities. And so by not providing this for communities, I think you, you're doing a harm to yourself as a scientist and to the, to the relationship with communities. And so while I do respect the two-eyed seeing approach, uh, Dr. Chris Musquash, an Indigenous scholar at Lakehead, a Tier 2 CRC chair who's a clinical psychologist, um, suggested that he really in, um, pre uh, prefers the concept of a sweetgrass model, where um, we're integrating knowledge. So a Western view by itself and, a, and an Indigenous view by itself have their own strengths, but if they're integrated together and intertwined where they're working um, intermittently, sometimes it's a preferred Western, sometimes it's a preferred Indigenous, but collectively they're significantly stronger than they would be apart. And so that's kind of uh, the model that we've adopted for some of our research programs. So I'd like to give you a few examples of how we accomplish those principles within some of our research groups. This is a devotion network for which uh, Malcolm is a part of our external scientific advisory. 
So we have four distinct research pillars, and those pillars each have their own research goals and, and research projects. But right in the middle of our group, we have a patient and stakeholder advisory committee that we um, uh, work with collectively to ensure that the community voice is a part of everything we do and that we can co-develop projects together. And we try to have that group in parallel with our steering committee so that as decisions are made moving forward, the voice of the stakeholder committee is on par with the scientific steering committee and that uh, anything that moves through this team is done in a shared way. Um, now, as a settler scientist, the other thing that I think is important for us to acknowledge is that um, to do things in the right way and, and within devotion and within our other research team called DREAM, when we have these meetings, we acknowledge the territory. Um, when we have these meetings, we bring elders to the meeting to start with ceremony. And when we do these meetings, we often bring young drummers in to open uh, our research uh, our research day. And so bringing culture back or bringing culture to your research group for the first time is really critical. And that takes some learning and some vulnerability on your end uh, as a settler scientist to learn these ceremonies, to engage others in the process in a very respectful manner, and to maybe partake in some of these uh, ceremonies yourself. An example of how to do that from the very beginning was shared with me by elders uh, Barb and Clarence Nipenak um, through a model called a PATH exercise, where when I was awarded a CIHR research chair, we sat down with key stakeholders from across the province in different areas of education, community, um, wellness, uh, healthcare provision, and we took a look at what would a path to wellness look like through uh, resilience. And by integrating the community voice into this path, we did a strategic planning exercise that allowed us to um, create or co-develop uh, a vision for what a research chair would look like. We've also done that for, uh, and I'll talk about that later, for the Diabetes Action Canada Patient Advisory Circle, um, where if we wanted to get the patient voice to the forefront of what we're doing as a research group, we needed to have them integrated in the very, very beginning of our research project. The other way we've done that is through one of the projects that's embedded within Diabetes Action Canada, and it's currently funded by the CHR Pathways to Equity, um, where we're looking at diabetes prevention rather, instead of through a lens of diet and exercise, through a lens of resilience. So very much like uh, Malcolm was talking about, we think the core foundation for child wellness is grounded in belonging, mastery, independence, and generosity. And so we've developed a program with youth, by youth, and for youth, uh, where those, those four elements are brought to the fore rather than focusing on the proximal potential uh, determinants of diabetes. Uh, we've published this in collaboration with our, uh, our stakeholders in Garden Hill. This is Larry Wood, an OG Cree uh, member of our research team who's an ADI worker in his community. Him and uh, co-researcher Elma McKay were members of our research team and therefore acknowledged in the publication and helped us uh, write this publication about uh, the pilot work we did with this project. So it started in Garden Hill First Nation. It's a program that's run and led by Indigenous youth. Um, we try to break down some of the colonial effects by providing opportunities for um, teenage youth to provide uh, caring, loving, warm uh, environments for younger youth to, to thrive in. So they provide healthy snacks, healthy activities, and opportunities to grow. We also provide opportunities for elders to connect with youth and provide learning opportunities. And then at the end, youth sit down in a sharing circle and decide what worked and what didn't, and then build on those experiences to create a program that's run and operated by themselves. Using this resilience model, we see significant health benefits, and we're currently um, expanding across Canada. These programs are run and operated by youth in the community, so as a scientist uh, who is uh, typically run by data and run by publications, we've had to um, really put uh, the emphasis on relationship building and let the youth run the program themselves. And as a result, by not focusing exclusively on data and the publications, we've created phenomenal relationships across Canada and have now expanded to 12 uh, different communities across five different provinces. And last year we held our first annual gathering of, um, of the AYMP Expanding the Circle research team where we had over 100 people across um, 12 nations and five provinces in a circle at the beginning, uh, following a smudge by elders Barb and Clarence Nipenak in a drum ceremony. 
And so providing opportunities for that uh, within our research team has gone a tremendously long way with building uh, warm and loving relationships so that we can expand further um, and make greater impact within the community. In addition to that, it's also letting go of opportunities to share knowledge. Uh, we provide youth and community members with uh, opportunities to present at different conferences. This is youth, a group of youth that presented at pediatric research rounds and another group of youth that were allowed 90 minutes at the National Aboriginal Diabetes Association meeting a few years ago to share their experience as mentors and share their experience in, in research. And so um, from the very beginning of planning a research project all the way to the end of knowledge translation, the community members are involved in everything we do. And we've started that from the very beginning within Diabetes Action Canada. This is a picture of our, uh, our members of our Indigenous goal group and patient committee, as well as scientists within Diabetes Action Canada. Uh, Alex McComber organized a meeting for us on his uh, territory in Ganawake, where we spent the day together making a, creating a, co-creating a vision for what uh, our SPORE patient circle would look like. Um, and we're not afraid to have babies at these meetings either. And so finally, within the era of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it's important for us to not only read uh, the 93 um, calls to action, not recommendations, calls to action, and implement those within our research project. But as a Western scientist, as a settler scientist, two things are key. I think taking a hard look in the mirror at, power, at the power and privilege that we've been granted um, and the current uh, disparities that exist in the infrastructure that enable this power and privilege to continue but also to read really important um, teachings from uh, up and coming uh, Indigenous scholars or, or, or uh, this book was really important for me um, through the voice of an elder on Forgotten Roads with an Indian elder, neither wolf nor dog, which really emphasizes that two-eyed seeing approach. Or um, this book here co-written by Chief Thomas Fiddler and James Stevens about uh, the Island Lake region uh, where we do a lot of our work. So understanding that, that con contextual uh, life that uh, our Indigenous partners are living in, it's also important for you to participate in ceremony. We often uh, take time out of our, our research work to go to community and participate in different activities so that we can get a better sense of what uh, culture is like for our uh, Indigenous partners on our research team and to be vulnerable and to take a seat and, and really appreciate what's happening uh, in the communities and see where where the power of culture and the power of connecting with land for some of these uh, for some of these members of our community, and then finally, I think it's important for us to open our minds and hearts to community relevant uh, outcomes. So within our research project, we've adopted the concept of Mino Bamazuan or living in a good way as a way to describe the benefits of interventions that we're doing, and also working with tools that have been been developed by Indigenous communities. So this example here, the Anishinaabe Yeji, is a method to assess uh, quality of life within youth that was developed by youth and for youth. And so finally, uh, if it weren't for the Indigenous people's warm hearts that, allow, that uh, helped us survive as uh, settlers came here, um, settlers would not be here today. And so uh, we need to recognize that that warmth and that, uh, that openness that Indigenous people provided to us and our ancestors to allow them to thrive on these lands is the reason that we're here today. And moving forward with research, we need to um, figure out ways that we can uh, strengthen those relationships and uh, pay back Indigenous communities for, uh, for what they provided our ancestors. So with that, I'd like to leave you with a picture of Louis Riel and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my view on uh, the settler responsibilities within this uh, research process with Indigenous communities. Thank you.